Okay, hello everybody and welcome to this bookshop.org event with myself, Leila Saad, and the incredible now author, um, Michaela Loach. Um, my name is Leila Saad and I'm a writer, a mentor, and an educator for change makers, and I'm the author of Mean White Supremacy, which is a workbook and guide for people who have white privilege to do the personal work of anti-racism. And I'm also the founder of Become a Good Ancestor, which is a learning destination for social impact professionals, entrepreneurs, and public thought workers who are doing the intergenerational work of social justice and healing. And for that reason, I am super excited to be here today in conversation with the Michaela Loach. Michaela has been named by Forbes <laughs> as one of the most influential women in the UK climate movement. She's a medical student who holds a degree in global health policy and as an organizer, climate justice activist, a self-proclaimed soft black girl, and now an author, Michaela's on a mission to build liberation and inform the masses through her focus on the climate crisis and its intersections of anti-racism, feminism, ethical fashion, wealth inequality, and migrant rights. And today we're here to talk about Michaela's debut book, it's Not That Radical, Climate Action to Transform Our World. I wanna say a big thank you to all of you that have bought a copy of this book. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Bookshop and thank you to the independent booksellers that have championed this much, much needed book. We're gonna be in conversation for about an hour and there will be time at the end for a couple of questions. So if you do have questions that you would like to ask Michaela, um, you can pop them in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom. Um, other than that, I'm excited to get into this conversation. So hi, Michaela. Hey, um, thank you so much, Leila, for that really kind introduction and for being here. Um, you are someone who's inspired me so, so much and also encouraged me constantly and, and, and often mentorship um, at times when I really needed it. Um, so I really also like want folks to honor Layla in this moment as well. And, and I want to say thank you so much for being here and echo the thanks to bookshop.org and all the independent booksellers who have championed this book so, so much. Um, I love that this book has been one that's kind of been fought from the grassroots up from all the independent booksellers across the country and from bookshop.org. And that means so much to me. And so thank you all for being here and have, buying copies. That's, it's amazing. It all feels very surreal. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to chatting more to you about it. I feel like I've been waiting for this moment for years because <laughs> we we had a wonderful conversation on Good Ancestor podcast, mm. my my podcast a few years ago. And I remember once we'd finished recording, I was like, Michaela, have you thought about writing a book? Because I really yeah. think you should write a book. <laughs> and um, I was like, I know you have a lot going on and there's a lot happening, um, but I really would love to read a book by you mm. and so to be to get to be with you here in this conversation in your in your first week of publication to talk about this culmination of these stories these things that you've learned as well as very much the um advice and instruction that you're sharing with those of us who understand this is serious mm. but mm -hmm. have no idea where to start mm. it just feels like such a privilege and an honor and such a joy and I'm wondering how it's feeling for you, because I know the the author journey, like this is the part where you get to like see the fruit of your labor. Mm. How does it how does it feel? I, I really think it does feel very surreal. I remember so clearly that conversation that we had. Like it's like it's like it happened yesterday. Um and it and that conversation had a really, really big impact, I think, on my journey to getting here and being mm. um a published author. Um if folks haven't listened to it, actually, like it was my my it might might still be my favorite interview that I've I've done. Um, because you were such a generous and kind interviewer um and gave such encouragement, but also um such respect for what I wanted in that moment. I remember at the time I was at medical school and doing clinical placements in the middle of COVID and um, with the kind of the height of the pandemic. And um, I was trying to juggle everything at once. Um, yeah. I was trying to juggle like medicine and and, and writing and, and activism and all of this jazz. And and I do remember so clearly you in, being like, you, you being one of the first people who really believed in in my ability to write a book, even though I know that I'd believed it, my ability in it for a long time. <laughs> But, um, but I'd said at the time that I wanted to wait for the right moment and um, 
it did feel like the right moment and right now with it being published in this moment it feels like the right time um it's such a a terrifying thing to put a book out into the world in in many ways um because it's like I spent a year and a half of my life sitting down in front of my laptop um and pouring my heart and soul um out um and some days pouring nothing out because I was too um perfectionist and too afraid to write anything at all um and instead kind of dealing with a lot of it, it feels like this kind of a long extended form of therapy as well writing of like yeah. having to um, work with yourself um but the the response has been absolutely beyond my wildest dreams um and has calmed that kind of inner saboteur that was telling me that um that I wasn't that I wasn't good enough or it wasn't good enough it's been incredible to see the response and incredible to see that it's been it's been selling out of of loads of books I was so happy incredible to see that. <laughs> Uh, yeah it's all it's all of it feels kind of beyond belief but at the same time it really feels like this was what I was called to do and what was called to write and it feels amazing that it is resonating with so many people so far Mm, I'm I'm so happy for you and I'm celebrating you you. let's talk about the book and the way that you open it so I'm going to read um I took a lot of notes when I was reading (laughs) the book um You open the book by saying, this is a book for anyone who has ever felt doom, anxiety, or powerlessness in the face of the climate crisis. If you've ever felt that the current situation is too big or too complicated for you to understand or even begin to tackle, then this book is for you. Mm. This opening really resonated for me because this is exactly how I remember feeling when we were studying about the climate when I was studying about the climate crisis in secondary school Mm -hmm. and I now have a teenager who is studying about it in secondary Mm -hmm. school and I'm just like I don't think that they're teaching anything different I, I think I remember being in school and thinking this is terrible but I'm sure by the time I'm a grown up we won't be in this situation anymore Mm -hmm. because it's obviously so bad that Mm -hmm. it will get fixed. And so I think about my daughter, I think about my children and how we have not made the strides that we needed to make. Mm -hmm. Um, And it does just feel like, what's the point, Mm -hmm. right? And you, you talk a lot about your own journey with climate anxiety, Mm -hmm. apathy, so talk to us about, you know, the decision to write this book and what you wanted it to accomplish. I think I had a very similar experience at school as well. I think that um, the way that we're taught about the climate crisis is that it's this ginormous, huge, impending doom, mm. but not really what we what we can do about it. We're almost told that this, there's this massive thing it's so bad and that's it and then it's like okay and then move on to the next subject or and also even in in being taught at that extent it will be kind of like half a lesson will be like oh the climate crisis is really bad and then let's move on to I don't know long division or something and it, right. I, can, I can imagine how um how bizarre especially for young people today um that must feel and I think that too often that's what we've been told is that the climate crisis is just this huge terrible thing that's coming for all of us or that's already come for so many communities um but we're not told what to do about it and or we're not told um we're not really told like how it came about how how did we end up here um it's almost like it's this kind of accident that that's happened um but we're not being told how to fix it and the importance in in writing this book was to really really try and change that narrative around doom um i think that when when we think we're doomed we don't think there's any point in taking action or there's any point in doing something because we've been told that our future has already been written for us. Or when we think that the crisis is just about science or it's just too complicated, we believe that it's for someone else to fix um, mm-hmm. and that we don't know enough and that we aren't qualified enough and that um, that other people have it sorted who are these kind of heroic or incredible people who are much better than we are. Um, and I think it was so important for me to frame this crisis um, as, and I hate to say this crisis as an opportunity, but the reality that the fact that the climate crisis has arisen from the same systems of oppression that have created the world that we have today, which is so unequal um, and and, and has so much oppression within it and so much um, societal violence that's been normalized, um, that the fact that the climate crisis has has arisen from these issues, and it it isn't this kind of accident that came out of nowhere, um, actually offers us an opportunity for liberation for all people and that instead of um the narrative being 
oh, we're just trying to stop doom or we're just trying to stop this very complicated scientific crisis. Instead, we can have a narrative that is, oh, we're trying to build something better. We're trying to build a better world where we we all have dignity, where we are all liberated, where, um, but also we understand how the world as it is now came to be. Um, and then we can understand that everything that we have now has been made by people and it can be unmade by people. Um, and so that kind of active hope was so, so important um, for me to include in it, but also to illuminate the reality of the connection to this crisis to other systems of oppression, because I think that in that illumination comes a, a huge amount of, of hope and also motivation. Um, and it gives us something to work towards rather than just to be trying to work against something. And, and I think it also kind of makes us that, that that kind of climate anxiety we mentioned, which I think a lot of people can feel, I think comes from this feeling that we don't, we can't do anything about it. And I think that, um, what we often do is we just shove it down because we think, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. I'm just going to shove that feeling down. I'm going to shove it down. I'm going to shove it down. But if you do that, it just festers. It's still there. Those feelings are still there. And they just like rot, I think, with it, with it, within us and, and get worse. I think that what we need to do is how do we do something with that feeling? How do we do something with that anxiety? How do we transform it or remold it? And I think that a way that we can do that is is by taking action, which I which I talk about in the book is can can look like a lot of different things. But I think that's the only kind of antidote to to despair or to anxiety is is to to do something about it. And and I and I am quite clear about what do something means in the book. I feel like often some people are like do something and everyone's sitting there like, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Yeah. You you made a really deliberate choice in the book not to talk about like timelines mm -hmm. and um, like phases and things like that, which is how we're used to hearing about this. Mm -hmm. um, you took the approach that, you know, knowing you is the only approach you could have taken, which mm -hmm. is how does this link to other systems of oppression and mm -hmm. how can we not just try and create what was the world before we were in a climate crisis, mm -hmm. but what is a world that is without a climate crisis because we are free of systems of oppression. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so then that links to that title. It's not that radical. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'd love for you to talk about that because you talk you talk in one of the chapters about what does it mean to be radical? Mm -hmm. And for many people, I think in the mainstream, when we're talking about the climate crisis, we talk about the crisis. We don't talk about climate justice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people may not know what that means or what does social justice mm -hmm. have to do with the weather, right? Mm -hmm. The what? So, for those who are like complete newbies to this, as I was, mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago, can you help us make the connections there, and then help us understand what do you mean by it's not that radical? For sure, I think um, I think even recently, climate justice gets thrown around as a term, but not really often like defined or like what does that actually mean? Um, and so it was really important for. The first chapter of the book to be like what is climate justice and and what do we mean by that and then for it to kind of and and the point of it is to be a book that is that is accessible to people who don't already know about these issues because i think that um almost too often we can be trying to like you know um preach the choir or kind of almost make each other feel better about already knowing about these things and it was so so important yeah. to me um to write something that kind of builds gradually so like um it sets out kind of so in, in the first chapter it talks about the fact that the climate crisis, um, when I say that the climate crisis is connected to social injustice, it's because the reason that we're in this climate crisis, like if we kind of go to the science, is because we have emitted like greenhouse gases into the air that are warming the planet and causing um, like adverse weather impacts and hurricanes and tsunamis and things like that. Um, but that's all, almost said sometimes this is this like, oh, it's an accident that just happened. Um, but where these kind of fossil fuels that are burnt to create these gases um, come from um they have been m mined consistently using the same blueprint that colonialism used of dispossession of lands from indigenous people of of harm to um to peoples all across the world um of destroying and polluting people's waterways and and of, of believing that some lives are more valuable than other lives um and some some people are more human than other people and 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 that same system of colonialism and then of course that belief that some lives um under a system of race are more more um more human or less human is the system of whiteness which i define as like a, 
it's a knowledge system it's a way of knowing the world it's um it's a power system it's about where's power consolidated it's not just about um individual prejudice um it's those systems of kind of colonialism and then neo-colonialism and whiteness that that allowed for the fossil fuel industry to begin in the first place and then if we look at the proliferation of the climate crisis because of course when fossil fuels were first being extracted um we didn't know that a climate crisis would ensue people were just trying to kind of industrialize um nations um but back in the 1960s um fossil fuel companies did know that the climate crisis was happening um exxon mobil who i write about in the book um and yeah, a lawyer has read the entire book and, and tried to make sure that I can't get sued <laughs> um, but for saying the important stuff. Um, but it is widely known knowledge now that ExxonMobil did the first, some of the first climate science back in the 1960s, um, which basically they mapped out um, the, the greenhouse effect that we're seeing now. So they mapped out what is the impact of the burning of fossil fuels on the planet. Um, and so as far back as the 1960s, they knew that their own products, fossil fuels, were causing this climate crisis. But they also knew, and this is something that's really important, is they knew what parts of the world would be impacted the most and when those impacts would happen. And they knew and were able to map out that those parts of the world were communities of colour. They were on the African continent, on the Asian continent, in the Caribbean, in Latin America. They weren't in the majority kind of white population countries. And even, even the if we even look at like the parts of the US that's even impacted the most by the climate crisis. Um, it's often also parts of the US that are majority like um, inhabited by the global majority communities, so people of color. Um, so it was a very deliberate decision made by first by fossil fuel companies and then very soon after by governments once they understood um, that the climate crisis was happening, that these communities, these entire cultures, these lands um, were not valuable enough um, to protect because bear in mind back then they did they did have technology that could have started a transition away from fossil fuels um, and that some lives were were able to be sacrificed for profit. Um, and that's how we've ended up into this crisis today. I I really do not believe that if the most impacted areas of the world had been, for example, Northern Europe um, and and the whole of the United States, I don't think that we would have the, the governments and the um, these institutions would have let the climate crisis get to the point that it's got to now. Um, and so I think that there is a very like deliberate function that whiteness and white supremacy, as as a knowledge system and, a, and as a um, a power structure, has played into getting us this climate crisis today. And I mean. And of course, connected to all of this is capitalism, which I talk about in chapter five, chapter four. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that section because in there you're like, we kind of, you, we, we use the term, but many of us feel very inequipped to define mm. what it is. We understand the harm that it causes but we don't we don't know what the alternative is I really enjoyed that chapter oh yeah I'm so that's means so much to hear because that was the chapter I had the most difficulty with because of everything that I write about within it of like I was like kudos to you Michaela because <laughs> this is a big one to tackle and then try and simplify it you know? yeah in in, in in one chapter to try and do it was it was difficult because I know that people have written entire entire books but but this is the thing is I think that we assume too much knowledge of people or we also like we act as if everyone had the same understanding that we have, or I think or too often we will say things that we don't even understand, like especially in like social justice spaces. I think almost it's I say I say sometimes it's quite similar to my experience in church at some point of like people will say script sometimes, but they're not diving into what do they mean by that. And it's almost like us wanting to be accepted, I think, in a group. And so we want to say the things, but I think in writing this book, I was like, I have to really understand these issues that I'm writing about. And I also want, if we want to bring people in, we have to be able to accessibly like explain. Um, and so yeah, in, in connection to all these other things I've talked about, capitalism plays a big role, but then, I mean, there's a, there's a whole chapter on that um, in the book. Um, and I thought it was really important um, to include and do it in like an accessible and not scary way. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yeah, I definitely felt like I learned something. You know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> yeah. okay, like taking notes, like, okay. Um, you and you talked about this right at the beginning when you said we learn about this, the, cri the climate crisis is this like doom thing that's coming mm. and then we're not really told what to do about it. Or if we are told it's these individual lifestyle mm -hmm. changes that we're supposed to make um, and you went through this and you share your own journey with, you know, how from a, the, from a very young age, you started making mm. very radical changes <laughs> to your lifestyle, right? In, um, in an attempt to do your part, mm. right? Um, talk to us about that because 
you talk about the fact that it's not just that it, it, uh, what I feel and what I understand is that the emphasis that's placed on individuals to change things completely um, like hides the mm -hmm. reality of who the major like who's actually causing these things and what will actually cause the real kind of change that we need. Mm. And I, um, I think that there's there's often this almost like um, this argument that's presented as either system change or it's lifestyle change. Um, yes. And people are either like kind of obsessive about changing every single part of our lifestyles or it's that we disregard that completely um, and the kind of, you know, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism argument kind of comes out. Um, but I think that what's what's really important is to understand that like we need a bit of both. And I think that for a long time, so when I, I mean, when I was like a teenager, um, I was starting to become more active about issues. And I write a bit about like how I got involved in like migrant justice organizing work. And that was the first kind of activism that I was involved with. And it wasn't big and fancy. I think sometimes I'm, I, I hope I made it clear enough, but like my organizing was like chopping vegetables and like folding clothes. Like it wasn't, I think people think that to be an activist, you have to do these like incredible huge things but the first actions that I did was to you know sit in a very cold warehouse for days at a time and and fold clothes for dis displaced people or chop food for displaced people it wasn't um big and fancy um but at the same time as as kind of doing a lot of that work um I was starting to care more about the climate crisis and um started to try and think what can I do about it but all I was told was to reduce my individual consumption, like to think about my carbon footprint. I think lots of people have seen those like literal drawing around your foot yep. and then writing down, <laughs> yeah, writing down all the bits about your life. Um, and I and I became fairly obsessive about well, what can I change? What can I change? And some bits I think were very useful. So for example, I don't know, I watched the True Cost documentary and learned a lot about um, the impact of the fashion industry on women of color in particular all across the world and garment workers' rights and, and union rights in, in, in um, especially in South, the South Asia, in South Asia. Um, and that, and, and also the impact of the fashion industry and that compelled me to boycott fast fashion. Um, and I also went vegan more from like an animal rights perspective, to be honest, than from like a climate perspective was first. But, and those are things I think that were useful. But then I became like, I was like getting so panicky about this climate crisis. So I was like, okay, I have to, um, I have to um, use no plastic at all. And I have to go to five different shops to get my groceries. And in doing that, I started to realize this can't, this can't be what is going to mm. cause the biggest change we need. Firstly, because I could look around at other people in my community who were working incredibly long days and who had multiple children and who had like other dependent or dependents or people in their community they need to look after they do not have time to go to five different shops to get their groceries um mm. and to get plastic free everything and to spend more money on their groceries to do that um and they yeah people didn't have everyone doesn't have time to make their own oat milk or things like that and I think I said the other day at an event that um I'd kind of like lie in bed like terrified of our future and then wake up and like grind my oats <laughs> to make my right. own thinking like this is how I fix it this is how I fix it but I knew right. that that wasn't true um mm. and it was actually it was finding out that um it was BP British Petroleum who actually their their original name was the first exploitation company which is an absolutely wild fact I had, um, to, I had to read that line several times over because I was like <laughs> No, it wasn't. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it is actually it's beyond wild that that was like, yeah. like they they were in their inception they were called what they what they do with it's just the exploitation company and it's funny that it always makes me laugh that they were proud of being first. <laughs> you know, right, they were like, right, right. We exploited first. Right. Um. But but um, it's it came out that um it was the British Petroleum who were the first to popularize this idea of the carbon footprint. So often people can say that they invented it. They didn't invent it. It was a mining company that invented it. Um, but BP were the first people to, the first company, sorry, to popularize this idea. So, and then we have to start wondering to ourselves if a company, which is um, like, which ranks in the 20 companies that are responsible for like a third of all emissions since the pre-industrial period, if they are wanting us to focus so much on our individual action, if they are literally if they're putting out tweets, which they do do saying, what's your carbon footprint? What are you doing to like, um, right. to um, better like the planet or whatever, whilst they continue to invest huge amounts of money into more fossil fuel production, which is the main cause of the planet, the planet kind of um, being in this issue and all of us cause it, um, experiencing this harm. We have to wonder, is this really, is this really it? Or is this, is this a distraction? Um, right. And I realized that actually, if I use that same time, 
that I spent going to five different stores, getting plastic free groceries and making my own oat milk. And if instead I use that time um, in organizing spaces. So if I joined, which is, which I then did was joined a, a group and worked with other people and did my very specific role um, to do bigger campaigns against in particular, I campaigned against like fossil fuel subsidies. So the fact that governments all around the world give 11 billion dollars in public money so money that could be being spent on like hospitals <laughs> or like mm. you know, schools um to the fossil fuel industry if I could try and tackle those subsidies that's how I said it sort of in my head that would have a much bigger impact than me on my own being able to like reduce everything whilst my community is not able to do that and so it's also thinking like how can we do campaigns so that these kind of things that are framed as bad choices when really we don't really have that much power over what we choose how can we make it that those bad choices are not even in the equation by camp and I think the way that we do that is campaigning um and also I think that it's so important I don't want people to think that um if you can't live if you don't live a perfectly sustainable life that you can't take action I think that that is a distraction and and there's a really brilliant quote by um Adrian Marie Marie Brown in We Will Not Cancel Us um, where they say like I ask myself um, who benefits from my absence who benefits from my despair and I mm. always want people to ask themselves that question um, if you're thinking oh I'm not perfect enough to take climate action who who's benefiting from your absence and who's benefiting from you thinking that you're not perfect enough to do something and um, so I always remember that the answer is often um, the fossil fuel industry and I'm, and I'm so annoyed at them that I'm like okay yeah. <laughs> I have to I have to ignore the kind of um that that voice in my head that's telling me that it's not enough um but at the same time there there are like in order for us to get this better world we are going to have to live different lives for many of us especially in the global north um but those lives don't have to be lives that are full of like I think we think we have to live in like a cave I think I say this in the book but that's not true um we can Mm -hmm. live lives that are joyful we can live lives that where we um have abundance of the things that we actually need and that we actually want and, and the care that we want um but so it's like, how do we do both? And I feel like I'm giving really long answers to every question because I do ramble, 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 ramble. <laughs> so that is me. I'm a rambler too, so it's fine. Um, Michaela, as, you, as you're speaking and as I was reading the book, uh, it really brought up for me something that I talk about in my work, which is, you know, I talk about systems of supremacy. So these interlocking mm-hmm. systems and that they have this 4D offensive of like attack right so they do Mm. four things that start with the letter d and you've talked about some of them so they distract Mm. us Mm -hmm. right they deceive us Mm -hmm. they lie to us they they give us misinformation they make us think it's this but it's actually this um they devastate us just by how violent these things Mm -hmm. are and they also try to divide us amongst Mm. each other Mm -hmm. as well because they understand that when we have collective power then we are actually a threat yeah. And I feel like you address these things in various ways throughout the book. I was really struck several times by things I would read where I was just like, I have, I've been taught the exact opposite of this. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. So like things where it comes to like, who um, has the biggest carbon footprints or mm-hmm. um, what does it actually take to re- like th- 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 these ideas of like we have to reduce population overgrowth mm-hmm. and that's going to be something that it will meaningfully help this crisis mm-hmm. um, or things like um, there's a section where you talk about the fact that there are plans that exist that show us how we can actually tackle this crisis and still have good quality of life for Mm -hmm. everybody Mm -hmm. which is something that I just thought didn't exist I just thought we're just stuck and so people are not um making change because if we make change it will require us to suffer and human beings don't like to Mm. suffer and I think and that is such a deliberate narrative that is pushed by the status quo and by the fossil fuel industry and it's one that is like to be honest if if anything that someone could get from this book it's that a better world is possible and and I'm not just saying that as a flimsy thing and it was really important for me to do the research to have the the bits to back it up to have the studies to back it up um because I think that we can sometimes say a better world is possible but I think people can lose a bit of that over time because um yeah it's a very deliberate function of the ruling class and of the fossil fuel industry and of the capitalist system in particular to make us believe that there is no alternative like it's a very real thing um that gets that there's a there's a whole book on it um called capitalist realism by by mark fisher um on like the fact that we're made to believe that this is the best that the world can be and also that when especially when it comes to climate activism um 
that or climate or climate work or whatever it is, is that we're made to believe that in order to tackle the climate crisis, we, we all have to sacrifice loads and therefore right. it's not attractive. But I think that what climate justice shows us and what, especially this, the study um, that I um, write about in, in the book, which kind of mapped out like what would our consumption levels have to be? And people will make out we have to live in like in caves. We have to go back to Stone Age. In reality, we just need the consumption levels to go kind of down to the consumption levels of the 1950s, um, but based on renewable energy instead. Like we, everyone who needs an air conditioned home would have an air conditioned home. Everyone who needs a home would have a home. Like the, yeah, these wow. things are possible. And it's, but we've been deliberately made to believe that they aren't possible or, and and kind of almost worse than that, we've been made to believe um, that the world is now is justifiable to some extent, like that certain people are less deserving of resources. And, and the fact that all that there are all that the majority of the population um, must be in some way not deserving of a home or must be not deserving right. of stability. And I think that challenging that narrative in our heads is so, so important. And I think that once we recognize the possibility, we'll also act with that possibility and we'll act being like, oh, more is more is available. And, and in the chapter um, on too radical not radical enough which I realized I didn't actually answer fully answer your question on the, the title okay. earlier um, <laughs> but um in in that chapter one thing that I write about is 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 a lot of like how in this world that we're in now where we might have to take or use different parts of the system that exist to to create change um Aurora Levins Morales in her essay bigger is better she she says like when we can't have it all now we take the path that allows us to have it all in the future so that we're not kind of mm. compromising that incredible like liberated future um but we're recognizing the limitations of where we sit today in the world that we're in today and and as well in that chapter I, I write about how I think often Audrey Lord's essay on the master's tools gets like interpreted wrong <laughs> like so often and I think maybe it's because people like to quote things without reading like entire without reading where it comes from but but in that essay like she's not saying oh we can never use any part of the system to create a better world or to transform it she's just saying we can't use the same systems of like dis of patriarchy of like oppression um in order to create liberation so it's like we can't use those same frameworks in order to create liberation she's not saying that we can't take a court case to, to kind of challenge something um and i think that um that that understanding is important and also on the radical on the radical part um we've been told made to believe that a future or a world where everyone is housed and has water and has food and lives in dignity is outrageous <laughs> or ridiculous mm. or impossible um and that is just not true like that is a story that we have been very deliberately told because it benefits a very very small percentage of the population um to continue to have more than they'll ever need in their lives if we believe that that is justifiable and that a world where we are all have enough is not possible and so I wanted to re reframe of um what is ridiculous and outrageous which is is the reality that we live in today and also the future that we're fighting for it's not that radical and I, I um a friend um of mine who runs the black feminist bookshop and um, when I told her the title she was like that's very black and I was like yes it <laughs> like it feels like a kind of thing that you know we'd say quite a lot it's like that's not, that's not that radical um because it's it's not like a world where we all get to live in dignity should not be seen as this big incredible wow oh my gosh maybe oh no that's not yeah. possible it should be this is the bare minimum that we're fighting for is everyone to be safe yeah but I also love that it has a double meaning because to so many mm. people it is that radical mm -hmm. because we're like you said not just asking for what the world was some decades ago we're yeah. asking for an entirely new world mm -hmm. and so it is radical but in a sense that is very inspiring and you know, imaginative, and you quote the work of Audre Lorde, the work of Adrienne Marie Brown, and mm -hmm. other writers who have inspired the way that you see things. And I have really loved seeing your trajectory from somebody who really was spiraling in climate anxiety, climate doom, to mm -hmm. like, what are the possibilities? And also, what does hope look like as an active stance? What does mm -hmm. softness look like? What does joy and community look like? And how can that be the thing, you know, because in my work as well, I talk a lot about sustainable change making. And mm. I'm really passionate about that because I have had the immense opportunity of being able to interview inspiring people like yourself who are doing the kind of work that you're doing. And I also know that behind the scenes, there's a lot that's going on and mm -hmm. it's really hard and it's really mm -hmm. exhausting and that we are in cycles of burnout. And it's because we have been, we have been 
taught a paradigm of change making that says that if you have a calling and if you believe that you're here to change the world, mm. you must dedicate every single fiber of your being to it mm -hmm. to the extent that you are now martyring yourself yeah. and you don't get to have anything. You don't mm -hmm. get to have any abundance. You don't get to be soft. You don't get to have joy. You don't get to have any of those things. And you talk in the book about like your realization of like, this is sustainable for mm -mm. me. Um, there's a sentence, let me see if I can find it. You said, I've realized that if I want to continue with this work for the rest of my life, I need to take care of myself. I need to find and prioritize joy. I need to be able to, to be my full self, a self black girl. I need to be living a life that feels like it's worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I'm so glad that you read that part because um, I was going to probably butcher trying to remember it from my brain, <laughs> um, every single word. But um, th that was a big realization that I had actually during the writing of, of the book. Um, writing this book was so difficult in many ways. Um, but at the same time, like a lot of what I include in the book, I didn't I didn't know before writing the book and I and th through the research of it. Um, actually required me to understand these things more and, and actually to, to have a lot more hope than I had even maybe when the start of writing it and I'm so grateful for that and I was forced to kind of have hope every day that I got up and, and tried to write um but it was it was actually it was during the writing process of the book when I was in kind of my I don't know beating myself up era um <laughs> I was yeah I, I talk about it in the book of having this kind of conversation with my brother um and and him just saying Ooh, to me yes. like yeah, which which he did give me um, permission to include. And I remember I remember calling him. He lives in Brazil now, so I remember FaceTiming him, and he was on the beach in Brazil, very happy. And I read that bit to him, and he was like, "Yeah, that's fine." He was, like, I think that's very humanizing, and it will probably resonate with people. Um, mm. um, I think his whole copy still hasn't made it to Brazil, but <laughs> mm. <laughs> listen to the audio book. Um, but um, he, yeah, I I was talking to him and trying to convince him to get involved in organizing, um, and he kind of said a lot of the same things that I hear from a lot of people but I know him so this is things I I know I know his life and I know that he could I, he could be doing more and he, he's he's very fine with me saying this um and it's just it he turned to me and he was like well why would I want to be doing this work if I see you burnt out all the time if I see you like being miserable a lot of the time yeah. because you are so stressed and you are like literally destroying your health for this movement um and I really had to stop for a moment and it really kind of punched me in the gut and been in a way that I really needed to hear um yeah. and I and it was quite a pivotal moment I think in my life of being like one like I need I want to be making movements that people want to move towards like these movements yes. I want them to be attractive and um and so therefore we need to be enjoying our lives within them because otherwise why who are we going to recruit <laughs> like who's going to join us if we all look like miserable and and and, te and terrible all the time um but also that I found that since I have prioritized my joy more since I have given time for it since I've allowed myself um to be happy um often and every day actually allowed myself happiness and joy every day and 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 not chosen to sacrifice my entire health and everything for this um I've also just had more motivation to do my work and more energy to do it. Um, yeah. and, and I think that one thing that also really struck me is I, I read, I'm not sure how true this is, but I did read that um, when, when Martin Luther King um, was killed, was assassinated, um, the, like, the health of his heart was that of someone like 20 years older than himself um, yeah. because of how much stress that he'd been put through and, and um, through the work that he was doing. And obviously I'm not Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but I think that that is a kind of a teaching moment of um, how it does genuinely get written on the body, how we treat ourselves um, and how, and I think that also if I want to build this liberated future, this like better future where we are all safe and have dignity and have joy. I also want that a, a pocket of that future for myself today. And I want to live in a pocket of that future for myself today. And I, and I, and that all of us are deserving of living in a pocket of that future um, today. And also that, that I think that we can act as if that almost simulating suffering honors those who don't have any choice, but to suffer. And I don't think that's true. I think that's actually insulting yeah. to people who have no choice, but to suffer. Um, we talk often about, um, and one of my favorite parts of the book is actually near the end. And I talk about, and I'm going to say this not as well as I write it. Um, but um, of like, I think we often talk about our, our ancestors' wildest, wildest dreams. Um, mm. And I think that 
my ancestors' wildest dreams, wildest dreams were partly that I would use my, my like the breath in my lungs to shout for for change and to and to try and communicate for a better future. And I'd use the blood in in my hands to to write to make a better future and and in my in my feet to walk forward and march for justice. But they'd also want me to use all of those same things to laugh um, as loudly as I can and and to sing and to dance and to and to hug my friends and to kiss their faces and to. And to live a life that is beautiful and and wonderful, and I think that um we do need to do that as well as all this other work too, because otherwise, like, yeah, others are not going to be able to do it for very long, and also um we're not going to really get many people on board either. Right, exactly. Um, I want to ask you a last question before moving over to Q and A. Um, you and I both have the same like perspective on the fact that to be an activist you said it earlier you don't have to be doing the most like Mm. biggest thing the most shocking thing you don't have to have a huge platform you don't it doesn't have to be any of that and you do have that right Mm -hmm. and there and so there's a there's like um ah there's like something that happens around like you use the words like platforms and pedestals and like Mm. your journey with that and understanding that. And I'm really glad that you wrote that into the book. Um, I'm glad that you wrote it for you because I think it can be very like self-therapizing to be like, what is all of this? (laughs) (laughs) So I was happy for you to like pick it apart for yourself, but I know that you didn't write it for you. You wrote Mm. it so that other people who may be doing this work and wherever they are in it, if they happen to get into a position position as yours, they understand what some of the pitfalls Mm -hmm. are of like influencer culture and social justice culture. And for those who aren't in that position that they not discount themselves Mm -hmm. as being effective change makers just because they don't have, you know, a public, you know platform or any of those Mm. kind of things can you talk to us a little bit just about some of the like nuances and intricacies of that and I and I say this because I I I don't think that that's a distraction from the work I think it's part Mm. and parcel of the work we do live in a social justice and social media world Mm -hmm. and the two go hand in hand and there's a lot of comparison that can happen which can add to that feeling of like, I'm an imposter, I'm not doing good enough, mm-hmm. I'm not doing enough. Mm-hmm. And I can only really become a real change maker when other people know me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, sorry, let me take a quick sip. Yeah. And I will say, I know that you are very uncomfortable with like being seen. Like, I know that you physically cringe at like, <laughs> You've already been yeah, watching my body language as we're talking about I, it. Well, and I um, know you. And, mm. and so I've seen you constantly, like, always, like, redirect people's attention to, like, this is a community effort. And mm. these are the people that really need support. And for me, as somebody, I, I had a call a couple of months ago, and I was saying, I just don't want to be seen as an influencer. Mm. And they were like, but you are an influencer. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Yes, but I don't want yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, no, but I really get you. And I think that, um, so the, the bit in, in the individualism and collectivism chapter, which I think, I think we then ended up because, um, that chapter had like 10 different titles, but each of them, um, never seemed to encompass it. But now I think it's now heroes, um, heroes won't save us, but community will, but it's all about individualism and collectivism. Um, and, um, when I say we, I mean myself and my editor Molly, who's a legend. Shout out to Molly, um, who listened to many a long voice note, meandering voice note as I dust of dusting myself. Um, but the part in that chapter, I think, is the most personal part of the book that I included. And I, just before it went to the final manuscript went to print, I, I said to Molly, my editor, I was like, I want to remove it. It's <laughs> like take it all out because it feels too like. I was like, is it going to be really boring? Because people are going to be like, why are you talking about yourself for so long when I haven't really done that elsewhere in the book? Um, But surprisingly, from a lot of the feedback that I've had now that people have been reading it, a lot of people have said that that was um, a part that really stood out to them because it just felt very human. Um, And also, I think that it's not, it's actually not that often. I think that because we live in this world where we have this kind of scarcity mindset in particular, we're almost taught we're taught that there's not enough to go around and so we in in response to that I think sometimes we can 
and because I mean especially a lot of white dudes will pre- present themselves as an expert when they don't know anything we're talking about we, we're almost um I think we're almost compelled especially as 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 black as especially as a black woman I feel like I'm almost pushed to be like I can't show my weaknesses or I can't show um mm. I can't show the reality of the fact that like I am just one very imperfect person and I and I also when I write about how um the pedestaling where you end up on social media like of of people thinking that you're the hero leader of everything just because you have a lot of followers on Instagram um that can sometimes it, it makes me feel like um like as if I'm being told I'm Superman but every time I run into like a you know a telephone box and try and like change into this like very like kind of extreme version of a person that I'm being told that I am um I'm still just me like I'm still just a very ordinary normal person who um I am very good at what I do but I'm not a hero like I, I don't have superpowers um and I think that this pedestaling can almost do it to a point in which firstly we like dehumanize the people who are pedestaling um and then another thing is that it makes us believe like oh they've got it sorted so I don't have to do anything like they've they've got it sorted so I can just sit because they're this superhuman and I'm just a human and it was really important for me to to just show that like um what I do is a role I see in this movement my role is to communicate and I've and I've lent into that role now I've now see it as a real role but there are many different roles and not not whether they are visible or invisible whether they are like given a platform or whether they are made invisible or deliberately have to be invisible because of I don't know safety reasons or many other things um or just because they're quite mundane but they're equally as important um and I think that there's an importance in 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 kind of visibilizing the invisible side of the work as well um and 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 I'm also am trying to lean into the like I'm so proud of myself. I've done some really important Absolutely. stuff and I've done some pretty incredible stuff in the last like couple of years and I'm, I am proud of it. Um, but I just don't, I think that I'm just trying to find, and what I tried to do in that chapter was find a way of leaning into that and being okay with that. Whilst also the reality that I am just <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm, I don't think that my role is any more important than someone who their role in this movement is like to fill in spreadsheets and to make sure that we get finance for things or the people who show up every day um I don't know people who are protesting on pipelines and who just show up to give people emotional support like but but I think that it's so it's, I think it's important that we yeah that we challenge the notion that all of history has been changed by individual heroes because I just don't think that's the case um and um, well not don't think that, that just, just like historically isn't the case um, um yeah. so I think that it, like we can find a way of challenging those things whilst also celebrating like ourselves and our roles and our uniqueness too I I hope I answered that question I feel like I just went on like a bit of a, a tail <laughs> it, it's you know this is what we're here to have a conversation so that people can get excited about reading the book mm-hmm. you know and there's only so much that we can cover in a one hour conversation I do want to yeah. move over into the Q&A but I yes. want to let people know there's so much in this book that we hadn't even touched on, right? Mm. You talked about reparations and debt cancellation. You talked about um, uh, white um, uh, environmentalism, which I found very interesting. That that cha- that like that mm. area as well, greenwashing and social licenses. Um, so many things <laughs> we didn't even get to and, touch and, on. But yeah, and I think also I think that we we have obviously had to like. Um, portray it as a climate book but it's so much more than that like it 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 covers I I, I look back at it and, I, and part of me is like how did I manage to do it or cover all of that in in one short accessible book but it does co- cover a, a wide pretty much all these kind of it's it, kind of things that impact our lives and our world um and um yeah I'm, I'm really proud of it so I really hope people enjoy reading I'm proud it of you. I am <laughs> proud you. of you um I can't wait for people to read it so I'm looking at the questions. I'm going to select a, a, a couple. Um, there's two which are kind of linked and they're to do with young people. Mm-hmm. So one is, a sh- and I'm going to read them to you both and you can kind of wherever you, whatever you want to share yeah. with regards to the question. So one of them was about, uh, one says, do you see a difference in the ability to be hopeful across mm-hmm. different generations? Mm-hmm. So that was the shorter uh, version. And then the longer one from somebody else said, Thank you for such a brilliant conversation. I've been following your work for a while. Can't wait to read the book. On the topic of climate anxiety that you've covered a bit today, there's been a lot in the media recently about climate anxiety for young people. 
mm-hmm. and the impact on young people's mental health. Mm. What are your thoughts on this? Mm. It seems a bit unhelpful for the media to frame concern about the climate as a burden to young people rather than focusing on positive action, for example. But at the same time, we shouldn't diminish anxiety or the potential impact on young people's mental health. Mm -hmm. Do we need some climate anxiety to motivate action? Mm. There's a few questions. Yeah, those are, yeah, yeah. those are, um, but um, I think I, I kind of enjoy the generational questions because I think that whilst, whilst I think, I think we can focus on kind of to talk to the first question, I think that we can focus almost act as if it's only the the younger generation that care about climate and I don't think I don't think that's true um in my work I have worked with people of all different generations I've worked with people in their like like I I one time when I took direct action um so like I chained myself to some infrastructure outside of um the government's department for business energy and justice strategy to kind of raise awareness of uh, the fossil fuel subsidies the man I was chained next to was a man called John, who was in his um, late 60s, early 70s. Um, and he was taking this action um, as well. And um, uh, and I think from a, from a place of wanting something better, I think that on, on where I see most hope, I do think that I almost see the most hope in like, and I talk, I write about it um, a bit in the book of like how, so Fazana Khan, who um, she runs Healing Justice London um, on a podcast, she talked about how in Islam, um, they say that the kind of, the child and the oldest person are like closest to to God. And I'm sorry, to, I know that you understand this way more than I do, Leila. Um, but um, I would, and and therefore they can see kind of the truth of the world much more clearly. And so what we can see sometimes is naivety in young people. Um, it's actually like a, this great, incredible strength of like of clarity. I think of of uh, and not being so burdened. And I've almost mm. seen that in movement spaces. Of it's like the people who've been doing this work for a really long time. So like, I mean, people who are in their like 80s who are still t- t- trying to protest all the time. Um, they have this like tenacity of, of a belief of they've seen so much change throughout their lives. Um, and so they are like, they they don't, they realize there's no, that, that if they haven't given up by that point, they're not giving up yet. Um, and yeah. we shouldn't either. And also with young people, I think that there's this um, this lack of being burdened um, by um these ideas of the world that can tell us that things aren't possible. I think when you're a young person, you're like, why, why is someone sleeping out on the streets when we have like houses that are empty? Like they, it just seems like these things are not logical. And I think that they're therefore in from those two spaces, I think that there's a lot of hope. I think that a lot of us who are maybe in the middle and I think I'm more in the middle, I guess I'm, more, I'm 25. So near in the middle. Um, I think that we can just get like kind of weighed down by stuff going on in the world um, and let that kind of, cloud our view of what Mm. is really possible um and so I think yeah I think on that that's what I would say about that and then when it comes to climate anxiety um I will also say that my friend um Tori Troy is um her book all is on this topic comes out in um July and I'm always here to and one thing in the book that I try to do is honor as many people as possible um who have impacted me um and Tori is one of those people and her book is called it's not just you um um I can't remember what this tagline it's something about climate anxiety there's the thing after it but it's called it's not just you and the whole thing is it's it's not just you who feels this way um but it's also not just you that's being impacted there are people like other places in the world that um the way that the impact on mental health is by like actually experiencing loss of land and and how that gets um kind of sidelined is not really climate anxiety um and I do think the way that we tackle so Tori does it like expertly in her book but the way that we tackle it in a mainstream media sense is it's often as if this thing that um in like many other mental health issues that um we act as if we just put a band-aid on it and that we don't actually tackle like what is causing this in the first place like um it's almost like we're trying to make people compatible with a world that is really messed up. And so rather than, rather than being like, Oh, you're, you're, you've got climate anxiety. Let's try and stop the climate crisis that is causing this anxiety. It's almost like you've got climate anxiety. Um, Oh yeah. Just forget about it. Ignore it. Like push it away. Don't, don't, don't watch these things. I think that there can be, there's, I think it's trying to find that space of like, that I, I write about in the hope chapter near the end of like what is it that breaks your heart and what yeah. is it that mends it for the future and it's the space mm. in between those two that I think will, will mend a lot of the anxiety and I, and I don't think that I don't think that it will it will fully go away or there's no magic kind of solution um but I think if we do something with those emotions then we'll be better and also but at the same time I think we need to honor the grief around this this crisis um it's very yeah. real um so I think that that's what I would say on those topics but I'd also say of course um do get Tori's book I'm here to plug my pal's books as well um, um she's she's great and 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 writes all about this topic 
Amazing. Thank you for that, that recommendation. I'm excited for that. Um, okay. I, I like this question. Um, was there anything that didn't make the final edit, but you feel strongly about or would want people to know? Mm. Um, so I had to, obviously in writing, I, I managed to cover a lot, but I had to, at some point, and my, my agent had to say to me like, Michaela, there'll be other books. <laughs> like there will be other books and you can include other things in other books. Um, I, um, I don't know if there's something that I, 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 there was actually 11 chapters, um, but I just merged them and kind of cut some bits out because there was, there was a a chapter just on joy. So um, Mm I'm just on the importance of joy. Um, but I hate odd numbers so much. (laughs) So I was like, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to. You wouldn't be able to live with the book. You would just be like, it needs to be 10. It can't be 11. It It would be 10 or 12. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. And and, and, I, and and the thing is, I wasn't and at the point of where I was with writing. It was like we did not have space for a 12th chapter if we wanted it to be the kind of book we wanted it to be. So I was like, OK, I guess then it's it's we're going to merge them. And so I think that there I did write a, more about joy that I would have I would have liked to have in, I think, more of a focus on it. But um, but it was really important to me. This is a book that someone can like get through quickly. And I don't, I don't want it to be a book that just sits on someone's shelf and they've got through like half of it and they never finish it. Um, especially because right. for me, the second half is my favorite half. If you have favorite halves of your book. Um, and yeah. so I wanted it to have pace as well. Um, and also I want to write many other books. I mean, after I've written it, like there are other things I've read. I read, um, oh my gosh, what by, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the book, which is so bad. Um, by Brown Hijabi on Instagram, she wrote a book which I'm I will I'm going to actually just find it very quickly just so I well, don't forget. I'm this. glad that you're okay. You Google that because one of the other questions actually um, is, um, do you? So she, they say, Michaela, if you have any time, can you please share who is someone we're unlikely unlikely to have heard of that you would like to celebrate in the climate justice field? Mm -hmm. I love this question because you do share a lot of them in the book. Mm -hmm. um, And I think it's always important to share these names. So people that we may not have heard of whose work we should go and check out and support. So I think someone may, someone you may not have heard of is actually the person I was going to say, who maybe was not directly seen as in the climate space, but her book Tangled in Terror, which is about mm. Islamophobia in the UK. It has a chapter on climate and on the, the links of um, the climate crisis to Islamophobia and, and um, of like war and climate and like how that's been connected. And um, and it's it's so brilliant. And, and we had her um on our podcast on the X podcast I actually wasn't there that that episode um but you can listen to more about um about her work and you can get her book Tangled in Terror um which is really brilliant um and I think maybe someone who because she's not like directly climate related you might not have um come across her work but her poetry you might have come across because she does like absolutely brilliant poetry um but within the book there are like please that the people who I even just quote a little bit please do go and like find them out if maybe if you're not in the climate world like Max Isle's book um A People's Green New Deal is also another book that I really really loved while um while writing the book so um I would and also it's been really lovely that he's been reading I don't know if he knows that I reference him so much in my book because he's been like reading <laughs> my tweets about my book and I need to, I think I need to message him and be like I feel kind of nervous about it and um, to be like oh hey by the way your book had a really big impact on mine um but those would be some people so um so on so also the brown hijabi's actual name is um Sahima Manzur Khan um but on your Instagram if you look up the brown hijabi um uh so yeah that would be why but I also I, I mean there are so many people in this movement who are incredible and amazing and like I could mention like hundreds of names of, of people um yeah. and just know that like at, folks who are watching I'm sure so many of you are also people in in this movement and you're we're so grateful for you and if you're not yet then you will be by the by the end of time you finish the book um and we're all so um yeah so 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 valuable and and, and the work that we do has such an impact and it's so important um and Leila I want to thank you so much um again um for this conversation for always being so generous with the questions that you ask and for the the energy that you bring into a space um and for your book me and white supremacy which is behind <laughs> behind you there which, which I, Michaela will always promote <laughs> and any I, opportunity <laughs> any opportunity I think there was like two years 
where there a week wouldn't go by without me having shared it to my story saying everyone go and buy it immediately because it is just so brilliant and so accessible and I think such an important book um for anyone who benefits from white privilege to read so um and to do it's a book and it really and that aspect of it really inspired my my book of it I want it to be a book that you don't just read but a book that compels you to act so um so thank you for that and all the work that you do Leila it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I want to. I want us to close with um, a question that is something that you recently. So you recently post about it on your page. I think it links to the last chapter in the book as well. Mm. So your last chapter is about hope as an active stance, and that's where you really leave us with like you know we need to go out and not just wait for hope to hit us over the head, mm -hmm. but actually go and practice it and live it. Um, the question is, how important is your faith in mm. this journey? And so I would love for you to talk about faith and hope and the things that fuel you. Mm. Yeah, yesterday, um, I very spontaneously wrote in my notes app on my phone, um, just because I think it was, it was Easter weekend. It was also Easter and Passover and Ramadan all on the same weekend, which is like, felt like a very, it's I think it happens lit. like once. It's been, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently it happens once every like couple hundred years or something, which mm -hmm. I was like, that's, that's pretty, pretty holy. Um, and then there's also the week that my book was coming out that I was like, oh gosh, it really feels like a lot all at one time. Um, and I've only in the last, like, I don't know, six, seven months, I finally found um, a kind of church community on this online, sadly, but so I say sadly, but it's still been incredible. Um, that is like queer affirming and is um actively anti-racist and is like incredible um and i've had a lot of um bad times i think in in churches that are not um those things um and it was and i and it's actually it's it's called forefront and it's in in brooklyn and i got to go in in person when i went and did the kind of bill gates challenge thing um which i'm wearing what i now refer to as my um as my billionaire shouldn't exist outfit um <laughs> because it's what i wore then iconic yeah <laughs> But um, I got to go in person and it was, and it, I think it was also there, like, I don't know, it was some sort of big sermon for them as well. And it was really, really beautiful. Um, but I think that my, I think sometimes people act as if faith is this thing that will, that we have, that means that we think everything will be fine. Everything's going to be okay. And that God will come down and sort everything out. Um, that's not what faith has, has taught me. I think what faith has taught me um, is, is kind of perseverance of, of even when it's difficult, even when things are not going as well as they could be, um, that there is hope there and um, that there is there is a breath that is there uh, that is present and that it, there's a hand that is holding your hand. There is there is there is I don't know, yeah, there is a spirit that is holding you and that is present with you. Um, and that, and not to forget that, and not to give up on that, and not to ignore that, um, and to allow that to compel you forward. And and it, and in particular, one thing that very recently I think has been quite clear to me is is um how much my faith has impacted my work in the way that it's what meant that I never dehumanized anyone. Like I, I just couldn't like because I was I just knew in my in my soul that every single person, and you can have this without, I'm sure people have this without having faith, but like I was from a very, very young age was like, um, was brought up with the fact that every single person in this world is is a loved human. And that the people who make my clothes are loved humans, the people who grow my food, the people who grow the cotton that makes my bed sheets. I don't know, the people who, um, the people, yeah, who are in our very global world that often are deliberately dehumanized in order to facilitate um, a kind of economic system that just, pursues profit at all costs um that these people are, are worthy of, of dignity and love and respect and therefore um it's our duty um as their siblings um to to fight in solidarity for them um and I think that that's one of the the biggest things that my faith um I think has given to me and that continues to give to me even if even if it's not a clear road even if sometimes um yeah I'm working things out I just know that the the divine is is there um and um that I'm just 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 trying my best and it's been really lovely that um my my mum says that one of her proudest things is, of the book is the fact that I thank God at the end of it and I say that, that mm. like that this that's um that's who this came from um and um yeah and yeah I don't know I don't really know what else to say I feel like I'm getting better at talking about it but it still feels like such a personal thing I don't know it's so hard to to communicate but um but it's been nice to be able to talk about it and um, and to feel confidence in talking about it again I think after um having a difficult time with all that stuff um recently um 
but um yeah it's, it's through actually a lot of my a lot of my friends of all different faiths a lot of us have been having some great conversations together um and affirming each other in in being competent about talking about these things a bit more which has been really lovely yeah I love that I love this so much I want to say a huge thank you to you Michaela for writing your book for asking me to be in conversation with you here this has been so wonderful so divine I want to say thank you to your parents um, <laughs> because on. they encouraged that you said I want to go do something and they said what do you want to do we're mm-hmm, here to support mm-hmm. you so mm-hmm. I want to thank your parents because they really nurtured who mm-hmm. you are today mm-hmm. I want to thank your grandmother and the impact that she's had on you you could just feel her spirit throughout the entire book and it is Mm -hmm. beautiful um and all of our ancestors i want to thank everybody who's here Mm -hmm. today everybody who's bought a copy of this book please share it Uh, there was a question that i didn't read but it was is this book um for family and friends yes yes with everybody get it for the person who you think wouldn't want to read it that's what i've been saying to people actually like get it for the person who you think this isn't their vibe i don't know i like that's who we want to reach with it Um, and hopefully it can have an impact on them and michaela's right it is a very accessible book and it really takes some of the um we, I know we've used this word a lot, but anxiety of like, I don't know what this thing is about and it's going to be too complicated for me to understand. It Through this book, it isn't, and it also doesn't talk down to you. It meets mm-hmm. you where you're at. And I love that about this book thank and you. I love that about you. Um, huge thank you to the independent booksellers who have been selling Woo! your book. Yes, independent booksellers. And a huge thank you to Bookshop for hosting this event. Mm-hmm. I am just looking forward to seeing what this book continues to do over the coming weeks and celebrating you every step of the way. Um, thank you just for being you, Michaela. You are thank you. such an inspiration to all of us and I love you very much. Thank you. I love you very much too. And I'm, I'm so, so grateful that we had this conversation. This has been such a beautiful, like grounding conversation to have, I think in a very busy time. Um, so yeah, super, super grateful mm-hmm. for you. And thank you so much to everyone for coming along. It was lovely to, to be on your laptop screens or phones or whoever it was. Um, <laughs> right. um, and um, do let me know what you think of the book and do write a review wherever. Um, Please wherever write a review. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.